Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Sometimes there is a big disconnect from what we say we believe and how we behave. See, faithfulness, our behavior should match what we say that we believe. If we believe the Word of God, we're going to take seriously who God is. We're going to understand His attributes, how glorious, how mighty, how powerful, how holy, how righteous He is. And if we really believe those things about God, then our lives are going to be very, very different. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms and Psalm 29. The book of Psalms and Psalm 29. Now, in many ways, this psalm is simply a psalm of worship. It outlines for us our mindset and behavior that we should have in order to worship God properly, to come before Him with the right attitude. By the way, this psalm, for example, is read on Friday night as we receive welcome the Sabbath day. What's known as Kabbalat Shabbat, the receiving of the Sabbath, acknowledging it. And what we see is there's a correlation between welcoming God's presence in a unique way, a way that speaks of his kingdom truth. Why? Well, when we look at the scripture, and this is certainly true in the new covenant, we see a correlation between the Shabbat and the message of the kingdom. In other words, the more that we know about the Sabbath day, Shabbat, the more that we can appreciate and understand the character of the kingdom of God. Look with me to verse 1. Now, this psalm begins by revealing to us who the author is. And it shouldn't surprise us. We've seen this over and over and over. We read Mizmor le David, a psalm of David. And I've made mention to the fact that we have the word shir for a song or a psalm. We also have this word, mizmor. And mizmor speaks about a, a reducing, a getting rid of things. So whenever that term mizmor appears, one of the purposes of that psalm is to show us to reveal to us, to assist us when we pray this psalm, when we sing this psalm, when we apply it to our life, one of the outcomes is going to be that certain things, those things are displeasing to God, those things that are not in keeping with the, the quality, the, the nature, the message of God, who He is, those things that are in conflict with his purposes, his will, his identity, all those things we need to get rid of. And it's Psalms as this one is that can help us very effectively do just that. So a Psalm of David, and then we have the word Havu, which is a word that means to approach, to draw near. Now, sometimes we'll find that it's to draw near, but how it's translated in English is to, to give. So it just simply underscores what the Torah teaches us, and that is not to draw near to God, appear before Him empty-handed. We love God, 
And when we visit individuals that we like frequently, we're invited to dinner or something, and people will bring a gift for the host and the hostess, an acknowledgement. And in that same way, when we come into the presence of God, when God invites us to the privilege of worshiping Him, experiencing Him, we ought not come empty-handed. So this word, look carefully, havu, means to draw near, but there's also intrinsically in this word, this, this call to, to give. So come before the Lord, and we have the term bene elim. Now, this is speaking, many, at least of the rabbinical persuasion, sees this opening up with an example of what we might call the heavenly hosts, the angels of God, that they too are drawn before him. They too approach him. And as they do, we should do. They will do so with great adoration, with praise, with thanksgiving. So we see here that it's first addressed to those in the heavenly sphere. Draw near to the Lord, O sons, and I believe many Bibles in English translate it mighty ones, but it's simply the sons of, and it's a term for God in the plural, but it's not referring to multiple gods, obviously, but many times there's that majesty of the plural. Speaking and using that to speak of how great God is. So these are the servants of God, in the heavenly area. And it says, come before him or render to him, and we're speaking about render to the Lord, glory and power. And this word, havu, is going to re repeat over and over where we say, bring before him or give to him honor of his name meaning to treat him with the proper respect. The word kavod can be honor, glory, respect. It's the word that is derived from the concept of, of that which is heavy, heavy in the sense that which is of significance. So approach him with the glory, the honor that his name, and the implication is that his name demands. And then we have a very important term for worship. It says, Hishtachavu, which is to bow, to fall prostrate before him. It is a posture of, of worship and praise. So worship the Lord in, and we have Hadrat Kodesh. This word uh, uh, Hadar here is that which is uh, glorious, that which is splendor. And then we have the word holy. So the splendor of God's holiness. There is something that is spectacular about God's holiness. And as I say, there is an inherent relationship between the concept of holiness and the purposes of God. So we come, we worship him because his purposes are glorious. His purpose is, is splendor. There is only good that comes from the will of God. And it's reminding us that we should worship God because of his perfect will that he has. Read on, verse 3. The voice of the Lord is above the waters. Now, when I hear about this, I think of creation and I think about order. We see that in the book of Genesis, Ruach Elohim merachefet al pnei hamayim. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And this is what comes into my mind when we see this verse, look at verse 3, the voice of the Lord, this can also be the word sound referring to his presence as well, is over the waters. It is a reference to the God who brings order into his creation. And then it says in verse 4, 
the God, the holy God, he thunders. And it speaks here, God's voice, and then we see the thundering sound of that voice. So these two words work together, the word for voice and the word for thunder. The God of glory, he thunders. The Lord is over many waters. Now, if we remember what is said in the book of Revelation, where it says many waters in the book of Revelation, many waters relates to a multitude of people. And what it says here is this mighty God. He brings order into his people. He is going to set things right. And we see oftentimes the sound of many waters is a sound of praise. So God's voice thunders. He reveals the power of his speech. It is in reference to the purpose of his will. And we find that this is going to, if it's done right, meaning if one responds in obedience, it is going to be the authority over individuals, over you and me. And this may be one of the, the implications of the Lord is over many waters. Verse, verse 4, we see here, the voice of the Lord in power. Kol Adonai Bekoach. And then again, Kol Adonai, the voice of the Lord in splendor. And we see that God's power, and the message here is that God's power produces that which is splendid, that which is honorable, that which is glorious. And what should come into our minds is simply the word of God. Notice how when we have a reference for the voice of God being over many waters, perhaps you and me, the outcome is when we are under his authority, then the voice of God, his word is powerful and his voice brings about that which is splendor, that which is majestic. Verse, verse 5. Once more, the voice of the Lord, Kol Adonai, breaks cedars. Now, this is putting it into a very, very manly or human understanding. Cedars were seen as strong, powerful trees. One of the reasons why the temple was was comprised of of cedar not all of it but but the roof and such and what we know here is that his voice breaks the cedars and the lord breaks the cedars of lebanon so it's another reference to his power what it's saying is he has superhuman a man cannot break a cedar, let alone one of those large, powerful, glorious, majestic cedars of Lebanon. Verse, verse 6. And this same manifestation of power, notice how it is acknowledged. It says, and, and he makes them dance like a, a calf. So the, the manifestation of the power of God, when it's done properly, when we submit to his power, we acknowledge his authority, it's like the dancing of a calf, the jumping of a calf in joy. And then it speaks about of Lebanon and Sirion. Sirion is what most scholars believe is a reference to Hermon. And we're talking about two places that reflect splendor and glory, glorious. So we see that God's word brings about joy, and it can bring joy and splendor to Lebanon and Hermon. And it says, of Lebanon and Hermon, like the son of Ramim, and this term Ramim 
is an animal probably having to do with a buffalo or such. By the way, buffalo by most authorities is a kosher animal. So it's saying here, the transformation. We have earlier the term calf. And then when we speak about Lebanon and Hermon, we see here about a buffalo, a more majestic, a larger, a powerful animal. So it brings about just that, a joy, a joy within that which is acknowledging the power of God. Verse 7. Kol Adonai, the voice of the Lord, we could say split, divides, uh, breaks in half the, the flames of fire. Now, here again, can you do that? Divide fire? But this is what God does. He divides the flames of fire. Verse 8, the voice of the Lord, he shakes the wilderness, he will shake, the Lord will shake the wilderness of Kadesh. Now, this is talking about God's word. Word is associated with revelation. His revelation reveals his purposes, his will. And we are brought to the wilderness, but specifically the wilderness of Kadesh. This is where the children of Israel They spent a significant amount of time when they entered into the the journey to the land of Israel. It's part of the, the promised land. It's part of Israel today. And what we see, it's on the border, the border between Israel and Egypt. And what we see here is when God's people is in the midst of his will. When God's people are moving towards the fulfillment of the will of God, there's an outcome. He is going to shake things, and this is what he's revealing to us. Verse 9, the voice of the Lord, over and over, kol Adonai, kol Adonai, the voice of the Lord. And then we have some confusion. Now, I would just invite you, if you go to whatever uh, place, you'd like to go to to check out multiple translations, you are going to see that there are a couple of different traditions for rendering this verse. We have the word here, the word ayalot. Now, the word ayal can be a ram type of goat, a mountain goat. But it can also relate perhaps to a type of tree like the oak tree. So there's a debate on on how to render this word. You'll find different translation of the Bible rendering it in one of these two or three different ways. So we have another word. It relates the word for shaking that we talked about earlier when it says the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. He will shake. The Lord is shaking the wilderness of Kadesh. But we have that similar word, but it may be different. Some say it has to do with giving birth. Some say it has to do with another idiom, idiom, idiom for shaking. And some has to say it has to do with revealing something. Well, is it about goats or is it about a tree? Well, what I would do is realize that this is a Hebrew poem. What is the number one characteristics of Hebrew poetry? Parallelism. And when we keep reading, it says that he's going to reveal, he's going to reveal them as as force. So the fact that force appear here would lend weight and credence to the understanding that this term means uh, oak trees. So the sound of the Lord He will will lay bare. He will manifest or strip or divide oak trees, and he will reveal force. And in, look at the second part of verse 9, and in his sanctuary, all of it, meaning everyone, says glory. 
So God moves, and the implication is this. God is moving. He's bringing change. This is what this passage is speaking about. How the voice of God, the sound of his presence, the truth of his word, the glory of his will brings a change, a significant change. And what is that? It brings glory. God's movement, the manifestation of his movement, the outcome of that, that movement is glory. So that's why it says, and everyone will say glory. Verse 10, the Lord upon a flood, and this is the same word for the flood, like in the days of Noah, Mabul, the Lord set upon the, the flood. The Lord sits as king forever. And here it's, he will sit as king forever. The Lord, strength to his people, he will give. And this strength, if we see the context, his strength is to participate in his will, to, to follow his purposes. And notice how there's a reference to him. Notice the change. And the Lord, he will sit king. The Lord king will sit forever. This is a word for ruling, taking his throne, in other words, forever. And the Lord he will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with shalom. Now, let me conclude by pointing out two things. When we look at this last verse, we see that there is a, a correlation between the Lord giving to his people strength and the Lord blessing. And then we see that last word, shalom. And I've made mention that the term shalom is in regard to the will of God. There's no shalom, there's no peace until the will of God is complete. We have shalom in an individual circumstance when God is calling you to do something and you do it. When you've completed it, you experience that peace. And what he's saying is that he gives power and his blessing is in order that you and I can be peacemakers. What does that mean? That we can do his will in this world. Remember, all of this psalm, according to Jewish tradition, it is recited on Shabbat. Shabbat is related to the kingdom, and we see that this kingdom speaks about God's presence, his sound, his voice, the changes that he brings about in order that in the end, there will be that fulfillment of his will. They're all say glory. They want the glory of God. And if you want the glory of God, you're going to be interested in the establishment of the kingdom of God. Well, I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. <music> Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.